Well, here we are back. This is Sammy part two. Yay! And because Kate interrupted me. <laughs> and I had a spanker butt and actually hung up. I don't know what happened. Don't! No, I had she to actually do it. did it. It was she necessary. She accidentally did it. And she was also going crazy. Oh, no. All right, here we go. No. So, to him, the military was about joining a brotherhood, about going through some kind of hellish training, but then there was still some kind of reward. You got to meet foreign girls. What it was barely about was at fighting an actual war, because at that point, we were oh. over there. So, to him, he wasn't going to have to go to war. He was just going to be having fun. Oh, <clears throat> you, let's see, who in his right mind would dare to enter a war with the United States anyway? On May 28th, 2001, Sammy boarded a bus for Paris Island, South Carolina, where he was enrolled in boot camp. On that same day, the New York Times ran front page stories about the spread of HIV in China and the declining popularity of manual transmission cars. I can't try those things. They're horrible. The business section boasted a story about how Rosie O'Donnell had made the bold decision to pose without lipstick and in a hospital gown for the cover of her own magazine. May 28th was... May 28th was also Memorial Day, requiring an obligatory editorial in the paper that recalled how when the United States had entered World War II, the nation suddenly gleamed with purpose larger than self, larger somehow even than peace. Less than four months before the United States was attacked, war stories were well-meant nostalgia. A great-haired man dressed in an ill-fitting suit weighted down with polished brass medals that were now more than 50 years old. In boot camp, Sammy was formally introduced to the culture of the Marines. He met with other New York recruits, a lot of young men like himself. There are some crazy psycho guys in the Marine Corps, he told me, but that's a tiny percentage. The rest of the Corps is made up of a lot of people who join because they don't know what they're doing. They're just here because they made a stupid mistake or because they have a family that they want to provide for or because they have to do it out of necessity. A large number, in other words, are people who sign up because they are essentially, in his word, lost. <clears throat> what the core is not like is Jarhead, he told me. When I met Sammy for the first time in 2006, the film version of Jarhead had just been released on video. He told me he was unhappy with the movie, convinced that yet again the Marines are being stereotyped as people who have to kill to live. Full Metal Jacket, he volunteered, was a much better film. I had thought that both films shared quite a bit. A grueling basic training that verged on the absurd. A theater of war that was confusing, if not ridiculous, at least from an individual soldier's perspective. A likable and intelligent protagonist who is the straight man to the bizarre reaches of military sociology. Sentimental camaraderie. But it was Full Metal Jacket's now legendary depiction of basic training that was scrupulously accurate, Sammy said, and that's why he loves the film. As did the recruits in Strubrick Kubrick's film, Sammy trained on Paris Island. And just like the one in the movie, his dr receiving drill instructor was ruthless. You need to stop, please. He, I didn't want him to kill me, Sammy said. The sergeant was intimidation personified. When the recruits were standing in formation one day, Sammy pissed his pants just because he was afraid to tell the drill instructor, instructor that he had to use the bathroom. Boot camp is the hardest thing you could ever do, according to Sammy. Each day, you left physically and mentally exhausted. Letters from family became sweet moments of reprieve. The experience was tough enough that he entertained thoughts of quitting the service, but he was afraid to, of going to jail, and his superiors made sure to let him and other recruits know that that is where they would land if they packed up and left. To survive boot camp, he made friends with a group of guys who would be with him for the next four years. He was closest to Dan, his bunkmate, and by the end of boot camp, his time had gone exactly according to the Marine Corps program. 
He had grown into believing that he could complete anything he set his mind to. He had learned how to plan, execute, and evaluate. He had gained an inner confidence that he never had before, and he lost 35 pounds. By the very end of August, he had earned a 10-day vacation before he needed to report back for duty. He went home and enjoyed his time off by Camp, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina for his, ah, let's see, by doing nothing. Then, reporting for duty, he boarded an overnight bus to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina for his Marine combat training. The bus pulled out of New York City late at night on September 10th, 2001. It was around 10 a.m. on September 11th, so he's still on that bus, when the bus coasted into a rest stop on the way down to North Carolina. The driver hopped out quickly to use the bathroom, and when he came back, he turned around with dread on his face, and he told the recruits that the World Trade Center had just been hit by two planes. That's not funny, Sammy thought. His thought zoomed to the attacks of 1993 and how people had died then. He walked up the aisle to the driver and told him that this wasn't something to joke about. No, I'm being serious, the driver said soberly, staring at the road. The World Trade Center <clears throat> Center's been hit. Sammy was confused and said nothing else. He went back to his seat, and while everyone else began buzzing with talk, he slouched in his chair, thinking about his family. As soon as they arrived at Camp Lejeune, Sammy ran to use the phone. All he got was a busy signal droning in his ear. I remember that. My uncle was in, lived in New York City, and you couldn't get a hold of him. It was a little frightening. He was frustrated, but he had no choice except to keep trying during his free time in his training schedule. He went through processing in a week of combat training without being able to contact his family. One day, in the middle of one of his classes, a drill instructor oh. screamed out his name, and drill, drill instructors... As Sammy told me, never call you in for something good. He went running. It was his recruiter on the phone. Sammy, your mom has been driving me crazy, the recruiter complained. His mother was standing like a drill instructor herself over the recruiter's desk on Fulton Street. He handed her the phone. I'm fine, mom, Sammy said to her question. How are you? How's everyone? Everybody in his family was all right, but everyone in the family and in the military in the world also knew what the attacks meant. The training at Camp Lejeune is normally physically demanding, but that wasn't half of it now. The atmosphere had immediately intensified as the soldiers were learning battlefield skills that they and their teachers now expected them to be using in short order. What everyone understood was the inevitability of war, and the new soldiers all paid very close attention. <clears throat> Sammy was at Camp Lejeune from September 11th to September 24th, 2001, and during that period, he avoided all television. He simply refused to watch the news. The reports on the attacks, the depiction of the carnage, the latest developments, when the rest of the Marines would head to the television room after hours, he would go to the basketball court instead and shoot hoops by himself. He chose not to see it, he said, not because of his Arab heritage and the complications that could possibly create, but out of his New York pride. He couldn't bear to see his city wounded like that, he said. But he felt destroyed, regardless, and afraid about the, his, about the future. And for the first time in his life, he started talking to God. He'd never been religious, but now everything was crashing in on him. His nights became solitary hours of sleeplessness. He was worried about dying. He kept mulling over two related questions in his head. Does my bloodline end here? Am I going to die? He made it through combat training and left for six weeks of job school. His options were in California, Hawaii, Okinawa, or on the East Coast. He chose 29 Palms just outside of San Diego in the Mojave Desert. He took an aptitude test and was placed in telecommunications, where he was told that he would be in a room far away from the war, working with satellites and state-of-the-art equipment. That also turned out not to be true. <laughs> from his time in basic training to Camp Lejeune and then to job school at 29 Palms, Sammy had told no one that he was Arab-American, and until he got to Kuwait, he had never mentioned that he spoke Arabic. He was blessed with a relatively ambiguous-sounding name and dark good looks. 
everywhere, everywhere he went, Dan was with him, and they had bunked together as well. Everyone simply thought he was Hispanic. Stop. Oh, what time is it? Ooh. If you want anything else to eat, oh my watch, sorry about you. You have to go do it right now. Actually, no, because you already had ice cream. You're done. Go brush, floss, and rinse your teeth. I'm sleepy because you're flipping on me. Oh, uh, well, that's life. I can take my medicine to help me sleep and then I'll fall asleep. Yeah. Won't be what he really was, was was a New York Yankees fanatic, and the World Series was on. The Yankees were battling the Arizona Diamondbacks, and the series went to seven games. Semi watched each game like a chess master, examining every move and hoping for the best. But the Yankees blew it and then and lost in the final stretch. And that night, Sammy surprised himself by reacting extremely emotionally. He got up from the TV lounge and went to his room because he could feel tears coming. He started sobbing uncontrollably. No. What do you, you need to. All right, I'm going to stop in a second. For what felt like hours. Why am I crying so much? He wondered. It's just a game. The stress of becoming war was added to his sense of loss. Later that evening, he returned to an abandoned TV lounge and flipped through the channels with the remote. He landed on CNN, which was rebroadcasting a special on the September 11th attacks. Alone and in a dark room, this was the first time he saw the footage, and he found that he couldn't move. He watched the show as if magnetically held by the electric blue of the television screen. As he stared at the images, the tears started to flow once again. Arabs did this, he thought? My own people? And his emotions began hardening into anger. Let's go now, he thought. He was resolved. He was ready to get his war on. But nothing changed that quickly. He still had training to complete and tasks to fulfill. In November 2001, he was assigned to Camp Pendleton and joined to the 1st Marine Division. It's the oldest and most prestigious division of the Marines in the history of the U.S., he said to his mother on the phone. The 1st Marine Division was formed during World War II, when on February 1st, 1941, it was put into action aboard the battleship Texas. But its history reaches back to March 8th, 1911, with the formation of the 1st Marine Regiment at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. He wondered if she could hear the pride in his voice over the phone line and feel her son changing into a soldier because he was feeling it. With about 30 other people, Sammy and Dan were assigned to communications in the radio sector. Life at Camp Tendleton was still relatively normal. Sammy became a, gu became a guide, a soldier dedicate, delegated to lead other soldiers. He carried more responsibility and was on his way to a prom promotion. A few soldiers at Camp Pendleton had been cherry-picked for the Afghan campaign, but not many. Daily life was generally routine, and Sammy began earning combat pay. His parents had bought him a laptop computer that Christmas, and he would go online during off hours and talk with people around the country in different chat rooms. One of these was Anna, a Puerto Rican from New Jersey, and they began emailing each other. He bought a cell phone and would call her when they could coordinate schedules and time zones. He visited her for <clears throat> the first time during a break in his schedule in 2002, and they became a couple. Later in 2002, he and the other guys from Camp Lejeune, who were with him at Pendleton, were assigned to work a general's house during the party. They, were, they wore dress uniforms and handed out drinks and hors d'oeuvres to the VIP crowd. The party clinked on well into the night until the last guests finally left. And then the general sat down and lit up a cigar. This was the first time Sammy had had any com casual conversation with the general, with a general. They all stood while the general talked to them with, from his soft leather chair. He asked about their work, but the conversation quickly turned to the future, to Iraq, and to the possibilities for war. Well, you boys better get ready. General said he puffed on his cigar. It looks like we're going somewhere. Preparations were now made <clears throat> every day for transporting soldiers and equipment to the Persian Gulf. Sammy became more worried. He made an appointment to see his commanding officers. I have a problem, sirs, he said after saluting. I have a conflict of interest. He shift shifted on his feet. I'm Arab. I can't fight against my own people. 
For the first time, he was telling them about his background. The officers asked him some questions and then stared at him with flinty eyes. But they're Muslim soldier, and you're Christian, one of them said. It went nowhere. They dismissed him. A few days later, he was back again. My parents are having trouble, he said nervously. I can't leave the country. It wasn't true, and it didn't work either. When he realized there was no way out, he began feeling regret, like less of a Marine, for these feeble attempts at getting out of the war. The Corps had respected him, and he wasn't respecting it, but South Dell continued to plague him. Was he less of an American because he didn't want to fight, he wondered? Was he like the terrorists who attacked the U.S.? Or who was he helping? He was nervous, young, and afraid. Back in the barracks, he told Dan and his other friends about what he'd done. And they sat him down for a serious talk. We're going as a team, Dan, told him. So you have to go. Besides, you'll hate yourself if you don't go. Dan was pushing him hard, and Sammy could hear the relief in Dan's voice when Sammy told them that he'd made up his mind he was going. He took two weeks off over the Christmas break and went back to Brooklyn to celebrate with his family and spend time with Anna. Park Slope was comforting and familiar, but within three weeks after his return to base in California, his unit was given their orders. Sammy started to feel that God was determining his destiny. September 11th had happened while he was on his way to boot camp. He had joined the military before September 11th. It all seemed preordained, and he began to read the Bible. With so many devoutly Christian sol soldiers from the South around him, the Bible was everywhere. They were leaving in 14 days. Cars had to be garaged. Everything had to be packed up. The mo movers came to his room and took everything and left a shell of bare walls and echoing sound. Sammy turned around in the empty room, and he understood that he was really going. And at 6 a.m. on February 14, 2003, Sammy boarded a plane with the 1st Marine Division for Kuwait. It was Valentine's Day. Love had been superseded by war.